Um, so to start, John, could we talk a little bit about um, the Countess's kind of early years and the family that she was born into and what she was like when she was younger? No problem, Grace. Constance was born in London, the 4th of February, 1868. Her mother was English, Lady Georgina Hill, well connected, the granddaughter of the Earl of Scarborough. Um, Constance's mother was very well connected. Um, so her father, Sir Henry Gore Booth, was the fifth baronet. And they married and had five children, of which Constance was the eldest. So um, how did the Gore Boots end up in Sligo? They arrived in the Elizabethan age, 1590s. Uh, Paul Gore got land from the Earl of Essex. He served in the army as a soldier. And land was a way of paying him. And that began the family connection in Sligo. Um, in 1711, um, the Nathaniel... Uh, Gore married Letitia Booth and Letitia Booth was a daughter of Captain Booth of Sligo and that's how the Gore Booth name enters into the wider family name if you know what I mean um, Slig- uh, Sligo uh, so they owned 33,000 acres in Sligo by the time Constance was born which was a, a, a sizeable estate spread sprawled over 40 townlands so they were a well to do aristocratic family but they were also well respected by all accounts um, so this is the, the background Constance was born into. Um, you could describe her childhood as very secure, privileged and happy. Um, she was homeschooled. She developed an interest in painting and languages. She learned several languages, um, French and Italian. And she, uh, she developed an interest in painting, which I might come back to later on, in art. She spent a lot of time um, horse riding around the estate. She loved horses. She was a very accomplished uh, horse rider. Um, at a young age, she um, won prizes for riding ponies and horses. By the age of 18, she was riding with the Sligo Harriers, which was foxhound hunting. So she was well accomplished uh, in, in, in horseback, on horseback. But by and large, her childhood was very much typical of her class and background. One of her biographers, Anne Merrick, was says that her childhood was no different than other children of her class and background. Okay, and and coming from such a a privileged background, how did she become involved with the kind of socialist labour movement and then obviously how she got to know Mm. and be involved with James Connolly and and Jim Larkin? Yeah, that happened around 1910. Um, Constance was living in Dublin at the time with her husband, Kashmir, a Polish count. And she had uh, she had been involved in the Fina Erin, which she set up, and most of the Fina boys were working class lads from the tenements, and so she was aware of the urban poverty. Um, she must have heard about Larkin beforehand. Larkin had been in Ireland a couple of years previously, unionising uh, dockers, carters, skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled workers, uh, trying to promote working rights for them. But Constance read in a newspaper a report that Larkin was advocating. Um, that the Irish unions take control of their own affairs and, and become independent from, from England because they were affiliated to TUC, the Trade Union Congress in, in, in England. When she read this, she became intrigued and on the 1st of October she went in to Beresford Place, the Liberty Hall, and she actually heard Larkin speak for the first time. Um, so uh, she was also aware of not just urban poverty but rural poverty because when she was growing up in Lizardell, Herself and Eva, her sister, often visited the, uh, the estates, the uh, tenants in the estate, and she would have been aware that not everybody was, was rich and privileged as, as she, would have, she would have been, her background would have been. So anyway, to go back to the question of socialism, she was aware of the poverty, that's the point, and she went to hear Larkin speak, and Jim uh, Larkin had just been released from prison at the time. He served a three-month of a three-year uh, sentence for embe- embezzling money. This was his charge, but it was later on quashed. He was charged with embezzling money, union money. Um, but in any event, Constant heard him speak at that, at, that, at that moment for the first time. And she was immediately drawn to his cause, his ideas, his philosophy. And she became, from that point onward, a permanent fixture uh, at Liberty Hall. And she befriended Larkin and really, really worked hand in glove with him. And we see that particularly in the 1913 strike uh, lockout, uh, where she established a soup kitchen in Beresford uh, Place, Liberty Hall, feeding thousands of uh, hungry strikers and children in particular. Um, so uh, she got to know Connolly through her work with Larkin. 
uh, Connolly was a frequent visitor to Liberty Hall in those early days, 1910, 1911, 1912. Um, and when Larkin left for America in October 1914, um, Connolly took over uh, the union movement, the labour movement, and, of course, the ICA that had just been established, the Irish Citizens' Army. And um, Constant also befriended uh, Connolly and, uh, and worked as close with him as she did with Larkin. Um, I might come back to the ICA later on, but that's generally her... her Involvement with with socialist, um, with socialism, I should say, and but she she I think was genuinely committed to socialism. I, I don't think it was a fad or a phase in her life. I think she was genuinely committed to the cause of the poor, as was her sister Eva, by the way, in in Manchester. Eva was representing working class women in mills and factories in Manchester. So uh, it it was it was there in the two sisters that idea of helping you know, poorer people out advocating for their cause, trying to improve their working and living conditions. And and from what you're describing, she was very hands-on in the work she was doing. She was yeah. right at the heart of things and actually like working, like doing proper proper work. And mm. um, do you think that there was a, a backlash against her because this would have been very not typical of what was expected yes. from a woman of her class and background? Oh, oh absolutely. By, 19, uh, by the lockout, 1913, um, Constant Markovich was living a countercultural life. I mean, people of her class and background didn't, normally speaking, um, you know, work with with, so, with socialism. Um, but um, not all women turned against her. Uh, the uh, women from the Irish Women's Workers Movement, Workers Union, uh, supported her, as did the Irish Women's Feder- Feder- uh, Federation League. So um, there were women who supported her and she supported them. Uh, but in terms of her own class, her aristocratic peers just couldn't believe what she was doing. I mean... Uh, the lockout was getting bad publicity, especially in the mainstream press, the Irish Times, the Irish Independent. So um, they were wondering, what was she doing, getting caught up in this cause and uh, getting involved with the police as well, because, of course, the police were, were trying to deal with, uh, with strikers and so on and the disturbance around that whole time. Uh, but, yes, so um, and it even prompted a letter from her brother, Sir Jocelyn, uh, she uh, wrote to her from Lizardell asking her what was happening because he was aware that she was getting negative, the family, I suppose, was getting negative press by her involvement with, with, with Connolly and Larkin and socialism. So, uh, not yes, there were people who turned against her and there were people who supported her. Um, but generally speaking, um, she began to drift absolutely away from her own class and background. Uh, some of the biographers talk about her cutting links permanently with her class at this stage. I mean, a few years earlier, she was um, attending functions and balls at Dublin Castle with the Viceroy and with all of the aristocratic families in Ireland. And yet, four or five years later, she was completely... She had turned her back on that upbringing, that society, and was now completely dedicated to socialism. Mm. Um, And now we all know the very famous photo of her with her gun and in a man's uniform that was taken um, before the 1916 Rising. Um, But how did she get involved with the Rising itself? And what do you think her idea and her aims were Mm. for the revolution? Okay, we we sort of have to go back to 1914 because uh, she, uh, the ICA, uh, the Irish Citizen Army is established in 1913. Connolly takes it over in 1914. And from the from the moment it's founded, Constance Markovich joins up. She's one of the few women that actually join up, and she takes a, a, a full and active part in that um, in that army. She drills, recruits, uh, marches with them, um, is completely engaged with them. And um, by 1916, by January 1916, Connolly is co-opted onto uh, the IRB, or should I say, his cooperation is is. Um, assured uh, the IRB get him to join them at the Secret Military Council who are planning the rising because they fear he's going to have a rising of his own. So the ICA, ICA now are fully on board with uh, the rising and um, they, they strike out in 1916 and Constance, of course, is a member of the ICA. But can I just go back a little bit and, and explain um, why did the, the Military Council co-opt Connolly in 1916? They were afraid he was going to have a rising of his own. And, of course, Constant would have been involved with that. And so they, they joined up. And uh, that's how Constant gets involved in the fighting, because she's a member of the ICA. And in 1916, she is fully uniformed and joins the fighting men um, up in St. Stephen's Green. Now, the photograph, the iconic photograph of her uh, fully armed with a uniform, a green uniform, slouched hat, the whole lot of it, 
Uh, that was taken a week before the rising, or possibly, uh, yeah, a week before the rising in Kyo Studios, the studios off Dor- Dorset Street, and they're clearly posed. So uh, Constant, at that stage, knew a rising was taking place, and she was getting ready for it. Um, so on uh, Monday, the 24th of um, April, 1916, um, Constance joins the ICA out, uh, out fighting. But she wasn't actually meant to fight. Women were not meant to uh, engage militarily. Their job was to support the fighting men, couriers, uh, first aiders, um, providing catering facilities for the fighting men. Uh, her own account states that um, she arrived in St Stephen's Green from Dublin Castle with deliveries and Michael Mallon appointed her second in command. And the reason he did what? Well, two reasons. First of all, um, he was short of men. You know, uh, He only had about 120 men up in St Stephen's Green. And secondly, Constance was a trained sniper. She was trained to use weapons and she knew how to use weapons. In fact, when she was young, she was taught to shoot. They had a shooting range at, at Lizardell. So her skills come in very handy. Now, this is her own account. Some would say she was not, not meant to fight at all, but that's what happened. She did. She engaged fully in the fighting. OK. Um, and after, after the rising, she became the first woman who was ever elected to Westminster. Yeah. Of course, she didn't take her seat. Yeah. Um, but what, what was the significance of this and what was her role then in the creation of a new state during the revolution? Yeah, she was elected in the late 1918, uh, December 1918 elections. Uh, she was in prison at the time, actually, in Holloway uh, Prison. Uh, she was one of 73 Sinn Féin members who were who were apprehended and put into prison, the so-called German plot. So she was elected in prison. Now, um, she was a number, a number of women contested for that election, I think three or four, possibly more, um, throughout the UK. And she was the only one elected. It was a landmark event to have the first female, um, you know, uh, politician. Uh, but she didn't take her seat because she was a Sinn Féin. She ran as a Sinn Féin and had an abstentionist policy. Um, she was in prison when she heard the news. And she apparently said she wasn't one bit surprised. She said it was only a matter of course that she would be elected. Now, women's movements were very influential in getting her elected. Coming among the Irish Women's Federation League, a franchise league, sorry, and the Irish Women's Workers' Union all canvassed for her and did a huge amount of work outside of prison for her. And I think they were quite proud to to have a woman, um, a woman t- uh, MP. So she was released uh, shortly afterwards. She didn't attend the first stall. She was still in prison and she was released in March 1919 and she did attend subsequent meetings of the doll. And then uh, de Valera appointed her a minister for labour. So that's so that's how she got him. That's how she became the first female MP. Now there is a story in the biographies uh, biographies of her going to um, Westminster, and she went into the cloakroom. This is apparently uh, well reported in the writings. She went into the cloakroom of Westminster. She saw a cloak peg with her name on it, Countess Markovich, and beside her, uh, her cloak peg was uh, Sir James Craig, which would have been interesting if the two of them had sat <laughs> yeah. together in Parliament, but. Um, so she returned to Ireland and completely uh, involved herself and committed herself to to the promotion of Sinn Féin. Uh, it was, of course, a landmark mark event for, for women generally, but I, unfortunately it really wasn't followed up in subsequent years. I mean, there was, by, ni- I think, in 1920-21, there were more women in uh, um, uh, TDs in the doll, Catherine Clark, for example, and more. So uh, she did sort of blaze a trail in that way, but unfortunately it's... It, seems to have stopped you know when the free state was set up that seemed the role of women seems to have been um, sort of curtailed or shoved mm. back a little bit or ret- it seemed to recede or retreat but um, that's how Constance uh, got involved and um, I believe there was a reference to her by Theresa May recently I heard really, I didn't as, know that. Uh, you know, to, to sort of acknowledge that you know with the whole suffrage movement and women involved in politics that, that you know the first uh, female TD was elected to the British Parliament in 1918 which is coming up quite shortly yeah. and would she have been like would she have seen herself as a part of the suffrage movement or would she have kind of distanced herself from it and yeah, stayed with the Irish Revolution she, she absolutely advocated women's rights but for her uh, a separate independent parliament in Dublin was a priority separatism independence uh, you know above all else and um, while she supported these women's movements, I don't think she would have liked um, to see 
women elected to get into the Imperial Parliament, as she was a senior, for her it was women elected to an Irish doll. So independent.